Welcome to the 2015 Annual Meeting of the American Academy of Neurology in Washington, D.C. This is the world's largest gathering of neurologists with an estimated 13,000 attendees who are here to learn the latest scientific research advances in brain disease. My name is Andy Imholt and I'll be moderating today's press conference. We are joined by members of the press in attendance at the annual meeting and by conference call. Today, we welcome Dr. Natalia Rost, Vice Chair of the American Academy of Neurology's Science Committee. The committee responsible for selecting more than 2,400 scientific presentations accepted for presentation this week at the American Academy of Neurology's meeting. Dr. Rost is also director of the Acute Stroke Services at Massachusetts General Hospital and associate professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Rost will be providing you today with a summary of what she finds to be the three of the top most significant research advances being presented this week at the annual meeting and those research presentations you should be sure not to miss. Please reserve your questions regarding each research advance until the end of Dr. Rost's summary. We'll take questions first by those in attendance in DC and then from those on the phone. Please remember to identify yourself and your media outlet prior to asking your question. Just a reminder, there is no embargo on the information being shared in this presentation. The first research Dr. Rost will be discussing is an emerging science abstract related to a new drug being studied for Alzheimer's disease. This research will pre be presented by Dr. Jeffrey Seveny at the Emerging Science Session at 6.15 p.m. on Wednesday, April 22nd at the AAN Annual Meeting in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Dr. Rost. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you to all of you for joining us here today. It's really a pleasure uh, for me on behalf of the Science Committee of the American Academy of Neurology to welcome you all and thank you for your interest uh, in ongoing scientific program. The study that I wanted to start this press conference with is a study of a new monoclonal human antibody which is being developed in an attempt to modulate the course of the Alzheimer's disease. This study, um, uh, investigates a compound that is called aducanumab, and this is a new compound that is a monoclonal antibody to the aggregated beta amyloid in patients with the early phases of Alzheimer's. This study in particular is a phase 1b trial, which is an early trial for those of you who have experience with clinical trial terminology, and the primary goal of the investigation is to study safety, tolerability, pharmacokinetics, and pharmacodynamics of this uh, compound uh, as a part of investigation uh, in this particular uh, clinical scenario, the investigators also look um, on the uh, results of uh, some sort of a surrogate marker of disease progression. And in this case, this type of a marker is a PET scan. So they use the floor beta peer uh, PET scan, which is basically uh, imaging of the amyloid deposits in the, uh, in the subject's brains. They studied 166 individuals. Uh, Roughly half of them have what we call a prodromal Alzheimer's disease, uh, meaning very early stage, and the other half had mild Alzheimer's disease. They looked at the results of the uh, floor, uh, floor beta pair scan prior to initiating the randomized component of the investigation, and they specifically stopped the study at about 26 weeks uh, to look at the results um, of the initial testing, uh, when they uh, investigated the results of the uh, of the results of the initial uh, database review, they realized that depending on the disease progression, as well as the uh, APOE allele uh, genetic carrier status in this population, they had seen a very um, uh, specific response in the uh, in the subjects per each treatment arm. They've noticed that there was a higher degree of what they call the amyloid-related imaging abnormalities, which was their primary um, uh, outcome uh, um, for safety and tolerability. And they've noticed that there were more of those abnormalities in patients who have had APOE for status positive, and also the ones that um, had a more severe disease. They also noticed that there was a significant decrease in, uh, uh, in the amyloid deposits based on the beta, uh, beta, uh, uh, 
PET scan, uh, flora beta peer PET scan, uh, again by uh, APOE carrier as well as by severity of disease. So in conclusion, they stated that uh, there was a, a safety and tolerability uh, findings that were uh, dependent on the genetic uh, allele uh, carrier status and also dependent on the dose of, uh, of the medication that they have been uh, infusing, but they also noticed that the this monoclonal antibody reduced beta amyloid plaque across this uh, particular uh, stages of disease as well as the genetic uh, carrier status. Thank you, Dr. Rost. The second scientific abstract Dr. Rost will be speaking about addresses migraine and migraine pain. This research will be presented at the Contemporary Clinical Issues Plenary Session by Dr. Uh, Todd J. Swed at 9 a.m. Eastern Time on Wednesday, April 22nd. Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, this is a study that's titled Adults with Migraine Have Atypical Correlations Between the Brain Cortical Thickness and Pain Thresholds. The reason I uh, chose this study to be presented is because, as you know, uh, migraine sufferers are very prevalent in our society as well as uh, 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 worldwide. And potentially these findings are aiming at the uh, complexity of the processing of pain in patients who are suffering from migraines. So the objective of the study was to evaluate the cortical thickness in the areas that are potentially associated with pain processing. Uh, there are some prior uh, reports that have indicated that people with migraine may be hypersensitive to the way they're perceiving their pain and perhaps hypervigilant to painful stimuli and uh, perhaps not uh, uh, demonstrate an ability of uh, distracting uh, from the particular pain stimulus. So the researchers very cleverly selected uh, uh, migraine cases and uh, uh, migraine-free controls, and they've studied the pain perception threshold using a specific uh, standardized what's called applied heat uh, um, uh, stimulation in uh, roughly 30, uh, 31 adults with migraine and 32 healthy controls. What they have uh, uh, done in that regard, they've also um, investigated the cortical thickness uh, on the MRIs of these patients using T1 sequences, which are also a standardized approach to, the, uh, to this methodology, and then calculated the region by region uh, cortical thickness to pain threshold um, um, statistics in this uh, case control study. And what they found that uh, among control subjects, pati patients without um, evidence of migraines, there was uh, what they called a negative correlation between the pain threshold and the cortical thickness in a number of areas. And uh, uh, the way I interpret it is that uh, patients who had um, higher tolerance for, uh, uh, for specific uh, painful stimulus had a lower thickness of the, of the cortex in the area uh, of, uh, of, their, uh, of their interest. Patients with migraines uh, happen to have positive correlations so that the thickness of the cortex was uh, uh, correlated uh, in the same direction with the tolerance for a uh, specific painful uh, stimulus. And so in uh, conclusion, when they actually uh, did a statistical um, analysis to compare which uh, parts of the brain may be responsible for this uh, as of all that um, all uh, emerged in uh, group-specific analysis, they've determined that left superior temporal inferior parietal region of the brain was uh, specifically um, uh, uh, significant in the difference between the cortical thickness and the pain thresholds compared between the cases and controls. Interestingly enough, uh, this is uh, in fact a region of the brain that participates in uh, attention to painful stimulus and orientation to that, uh, uh, to that stimulus. And uh, the conclusions that the authors had is that uh, perhaps absence of normal correlation uh, may represent the inability of people with migraine to inhibit pain sensation by shifting attention away from that pain. Our third research topic Dr. Rost will address is regarding a clinical trial for the treatment for stroke. This presentation is led by Dr. Dietrich Dippel and will, place, uh, will take place during the clinical trials plenary session on Friday, April 24th at noon. Thank you. Um, as a stroke neurologist, um, I uh, particularly picked this study, not necessarily for the novelty of the breaking science that we have at the AN, because for some of you who are following the news, the study was first released during the World Stroke Organization um, um, uh, Congress in Turkey uh, in October of last year. 
but there are very few game changers uh, that come during our lifetimes. And I think this study in particular was one of these. And again, as a stroke neurologist and somebody who is really invested in treatment of acute stroke, I felt that bringing Mr. Clean, uh, which this study is known uh, by, um, to the general public of the American Academy of Neurology was an important and also, uh, I think, uh, 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 an opportunity that builds the bridges to the future uh, of treatments that we can bring to our patient event. So in this study, in a very simple design, the uh, uh, neurologists from Netherlands were able to coordinate uh, a number of academic centers that participate in interventional care of the acute stroke. And by that, they created a network that allowed treating every patient who may potentially qualify to be treated in a standard uh, way and also with a specific selection by the, um, by the government of the uh, Netherlands that endorsed that type of treatment only through uh, the clinical trial networks. Within a few short years, they've been able to enroll 500 patients, which is unprecedented uh, in the history of acute stroke trials that used intervention before. And in, the, in that trial, they've compared a group that has been treated uh, using standard of care, which in many cases, as you know, for acute stroke patients would be intravenous thrombolysis. Uh, compared to the group of patients who receive standard care plus intraarterial intervention. In many of, of these cases, in the majority, they underwent what's called mechanical thrombectomy, which is a procedure that is similar to catheterization that's often used for the, uh, uh, for the coronary, for example, care, in, except for this uh, type of uh, procedure, they actually thread the catheter all the way to the intracerebral vessel, right at the side where the thrombus is located, and they are able to deploy uh, whatever whatever um, uh, devices are available to them at the time throughout the history of treatment of acute stroke, we went from uh, trying to disrupt the clot by using mechanical wire to going through a pigtail type um, uh, retriever called Mercer Retriever. And nowadays, the generation of devices called stent retrievers, which is a device that basically deploys a stent at the end of the uh, catheter tube, and that stent initially smashes the clot against the vessel wall and then is able to retrieve it once the uh, pieces of clot are settled in the mesh of the stent. So in this particular trial, in a very simple and elegant design, they've been able to show that those patients who underwent mechanical thrombectomy in addition to the standard of care treatment had actually a uh, greater proportion of better uh, functional outcomes at 90 days. And the functional outcome in this study was defined as functional independence, which is modified ranking score less than two, uh, at, at which point patients are able to ambulate. Um, this uh, trial has set uh, a wave of events. Most of them were associated with a number of ongoing trials of intraarterial intervention at the time to break their databases and look at the interim results and evaluate their uh, results. And at this point, I think we have six additional trials that have shown um, benefit of a mechanical thrombectomy added to the uh, standard of care. Most of the time, it's intravenous uh, thrombolysis to demonstrate that uh, outcomes in this particular population of the patients with acute stroke are beneficial. Thank you, Dr. Rost. Please note the study authors on the research articles can be reached through contacting Rachel Soroka and Michelle Ewer with the AAN Media Department. On behalf of the American Academy of Neurology, I'd like to thank Dr. Rost and the members of media for attending today. For more information about the American Academy of Neurology's 67th annual meeting, please go to aan.com. That's aan.com. For the American Academy of Neurology, I'm Andy Imholt.